Thank you, Don. Um, and it's really an honor to be here. We say that often when we when we speak at meetings, and I really do mean it um, today. I mean, just I want to pause and look back over this workshop over the years. It's I don't think just track, but I I think it's helped foster the growth of the field of exoplanets. Um, and since I'm the last speaker, I just want to pause, and I think we should all just thank the people that made this happen this year and really for the last 14. So can we just like thank next sign and make sure that it's not happening. And I'm sure Don will tell you like all the specific people that need to be thanked, but it, you know, it's good to pause and just thank the whole crew. By the way, if you, when they're hiring, this is a great group. So like when they're hiring, try to get your foot in the door here. They're really collaborative. They're really great people, like highest recommendation. I'd send my students here without any hesitation. So pick a side. Um, what's that? No, no, I'm, I'm and I would say this if we were like having, if I was having one-on-one -on -one coffee with any of you for real, like I, I don't say things like that publicly if I don't mean them. Um, it made me think though, like I was going back in time, like what was I doing at the time that the Sagan workshop was just starting up? So that's a picture of me when I was a postdoc at UW. There's an IR spectrum in the background, Kevin. So like I did start off in the IR. Um, I'll let you read this because there's like a lesson here for any early career people. Like you can mess up in the most embarrassing ways, putting abstracts out with things that you thought your co-authors were going to catch before you took it out. And then it gets published and it's on archive. And like, so you, you can make big, huge mistakes and recover from them and end up up here one day. So, you know, the next time you mess up, pull this abstract down and take a look at it and reassure yourself that it's going to be okay. Um, I also want to think back, not just for what this workshop's done, where I was, you know, when this workshop started, but where we were at as a field, you know, and, and what we as a community have done in exoplanet science over the last 15 years, it's it's changed the most fundamental kind of astronomy that we do. We, it's changed the way that we look at the night sky. You know, when I was even a graduate student, I could go out and I could count stars in the sky, but I wouldn't know how many planets were up there with those stars. And we know that now, right? We, we know how many planets are out there. We're, we have estimates, we can argue about the number, but we have a good idea of how many planets that could harbor life are around those stars as well. And that's different. Like the night sky is fundamentally different. If you look at the Drake equation, and it, it's not about like what the answer is to me on the left side of the equation, but what I love about the Drake equation is the way that the terms in the equation have tracked our progress of understanding the night sky and the, the things that exist in the universe as we march through those terms. And I think that's also a good framing for what we're going to do next, right? Because the space telescopes, the ground-based facilities, the astronomers in the community that have used those facilities have advanced us not just to understand the formation of star, uh, the rate of star formation uh, in the galaxy, but the fraction of stars that have planets and it is a birth, the fraction of uh, planets or the average number of planets that could harbor life around stars. Um, and HWO is gonna take us one step further. Okay, we're gonna, the goal is to not just directly image exoplanets in the habitable zone, rocky sized ones, but to do that often enough where we could make some estimates of how common signs of life are. I don't wanna say how common life itself is, and I'll talk about that publicly and wax poetically about it sometimes, but like, among scientists, we're going to just see how how often the biosignatures themselves show up. And then we have like a long decades late debate with each other about what that actually means. But we can at least measure the abundance of things like oxygen and methane or oxygen and methane together in an atmosphere on a potentially habitable world. That's the next step in the Drake equation in some ways. Um, but before we talk about that, I want to think again about what we learned from the last 15 years, not just Ada Sabirth, not just the statistical stuff. But what have we learned about exoplanet demographics? What are the surprises we've seen in the discoveries we've made, again, both with ground and space-based observatories? How have those discoveries changed how we think about our home planetary system and its evolution over time? And that's mostly been an astrophysical orbital mass radius characterization, right? And we can get a little bit of composition. Um, as we've heard this week, that's the next wave, right? We're gonna start doing, we've started to do, and the next wave of work is really understanding the chemical characterization of exoplanets, right? But, and all of this uncovers surprises, right? If, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be research, okay? And, and as we've discovered not just Ada sub Earth and, the, and the, the, the abundance of planets around other stars, we also have demographic information on all kinds of planets. And that's changed our literal models of dynamics and how planets form. And that in turn has changed, again, how, what I said earlier, our understanding of our, our own solar system's planets have, have evolved over time. And I look forward 
for the lessons we're going to learn about that in the next 10 years, about the chemistry of planets writ large, and how that influences our models of our own solar system worlds, and then thinking into the future, what we might learn with HWO, because that's the point where the chemical characterization is going to be done often enough and precisely enough to really be focused on looking for those biosignature gases you've been hearing about today. <clears throat> the way we're going to do this, as I think you've heard before, is we're going to do a direct image. We're going to black out the starlight from a host star um, and capture that one pixel of light from the potentially habitable world around it. And you know, the, the namesake of this workshop talked about that pale blue dot and how precious it was, how, how poetic it was that everything we've ever done, anything any other human or any other being on this planet has ever done is on that one pale blue dot, which is poetic. Now to us as scientists, the challenge is how do you turn that one pixel into an understanding of whether or not there's a global biosphere? And the answer again, as we've heard repeatedly this week, is it's not about the spatial resolution we get on that world, but on the spectral resolution. We're gonna spread that light out, analyze the wavelengths that come into the telescope, and through analyzing those wavelengths, characterize the chemistry of that planet's atmosphere, just as we're doing with JWST for a variety of worlds right now. And in this case, look for the spectral signatures of gases that might indicate the presence of life. Now, when we're doing this, we wanna, we want to think outside the box, and this is a challenge for astrobiology, whether you're talking about exoplanets, solar system work, the evidence for the earliest life on Earth. We want to think out the outside the box and have an open mind for weird life, right? We're talking about aliens. We should be willing to accept alien forms of life as well. One of the challenges with that is if you go too weird, <laughs> you, you might think some things are alive that aren't life at all. Right? Like think about the Allen Hills meteorite. I, you know, for me, one of the first experiences I had with astrobiology wasn't as a scientist, it was like, I think as a high school student, when the president of the United States called a press conference announcing that we found evidence that we are not alone because there were foss fossils, little tiny, 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 tiny fossils on a meteorite that had landed on Earth and Antarctica that had been ejected off the surface of Mars. Now, subsequent research has shown that it's really hard to package life in a, in a vessel as small as those fossils were, and I think the consensus of the astrobiology community is that's not strong evidence of life now. Um, but by allowing the weird stuff in, we kind of went too far, in my opinion, in retrospect. Now, I, I don't want to knock that work of the authors because they were rigorous. You, but you go back, look at the press conference on YouTube. They were really careful in the way they described it. But for me, the lesson for the exoplanet field is we need to think in advance about letting the weird stuff in, but not let it get so weird that we think that things that are not alive are in fact alive, call the press conference and then not be right afterwards. Now, one way to do that is to look at the other kinds of life at the global level that have existed on our own home planet that we have a rock record for. We know exists because there's data and evidence supporting it, right? We don't have any evidence of alien worlds beyond our solar system, but we do have geological evidence of alien worlds within our planet's history. Um, if you look, this is on the on the left, this is figure one one of the decadal survey, also in the Livorn Havex reports. This is a plot on the left going up, you go backwards in time. And on the x-axis, it's the composition of gases in the Earth's atmosphere that changed over time. And that those changes are step functions. There's there's very gradual changes over time, and then we reach a tipping point in the atmosphere composition where things change rapidly. And those changes are a result of interactions between the biosphere and the other components of the Earth system. They only happen because the biology is there and interacting with the other parts of the planet. And every time that change happens, the biosignatures that, that are uh, uh, in high enough concentrations to be detected remotely also change, right? The oxygen that we have, that I'm breathing, trying to get into my lungs right now to power me through the rest of this talk, you know, that wouldn't have been around during the Archean Earth, right? When the predominant metabolism, the predominant way that life make, made energy produced methane and not oxygen. So if I was a methane breathing organism, I could still stand up here and, and yap at, at y'all, like just talk at y'all, but I don't breathe methane. So I would be in trouble if this was, if I was giving the talk then. So we have to think not just about what the biosignatures are today, but what they would have been through earth history. Okay. So this would be like, you know, looking for methane. Heard about this from Eddie this morning. Now, the cool thing for HWO is it's based on the Louvorn Habex studies, both at, by the way, another cool thing, Louvorn Habex were like, oh, you, you know, they viewed us as like competitors in a competition when the Decadal survey, like we had the same exact figure in our reports, right? That tells you something about the level of collaboration that was going on between those teams heading into the decadal survey. Like we, we, we viewed ourselves as one big team studying a subset of architectures that were preparing our field for different versions of the future. Anyway, really proud of this in so many ways. And, and it's also based on the work of Jada Arney, who's a rock star, started off as a graduate student, I helped mentor, like this is like my favorite thing ever. 
Um, we also have to think about the thing I said before, which is eliminating the false positives, the ways that nature could trick us into thinking a dead planet is alive. And the way you do that is through context. There's work by Jamie Krauss, who's I think somewhere in the back, um, showing that we have to not just look for one gas like oxygen or methane, but we have to look at the other gases in the atmosphere that'll help constrain the production rates of the primary biosignature to be so high that the fluxes require biology um, to produce them. And, and the plot here is showing how much of uh, what abundance of methane you get for different combinations of oxygen and methane in the atmosphere, or different uh, combinations of oxygen concentration and methane flux. And that tells you how we could go from concentrations of oxygen and methane to a methane flux, which the, the difference in like how much methane you can get in an abiotic for, versus biotic atmosphere, in the concentration space, the differences are small. In flux space, we have orders of magnitude difference. And that's why we want to get to the fluxes, which is what Jamie's work shows. Work by Amber Young, who would be here today, but she just graduated. She just de successfully defended her PhD last week. So congrats to Amber. Um, so Amber uh, has done work to show how we would implement this and look at the different gases we need to constrain the fluxes um, with a coronagraph. Like people talk about coronagraphs and starshades. Starshades, you get the full spectrum, like, like probably a half or a third of the chart I'm showing all at once. A coronagraph is nice because it's nimble. You can point and click it at your target and then point again and click it. Starshade, you got a slew across the sky. Coronagraph, you point and click. The problem is you only get 10% of the spectrum, like either the, the, the reddish or the purple or the yellowish band. You only get one of those at a time. So it's really not point and click, point and click. A coronagraph is more like point and click and click and click and click until you fill up your spectrum. And so the question is how many times do you have to click on a target before you can get a good enough uh, 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 retrieval on the gases, not just the single biosignature gas, but the contextual gases that tell you that the flux of the one is sufficiently high to require biology. What Amber's shown in her work, and it'll be submitted soon, is that um, you're going to get you're going to get that after just two or three observations. You don't need the full spectrum. The full spectrum is always great. Like I'm a scientist, I don't want to throw away photons or spectral wavelength range, but in terms of how fast we can get to an answer, two or three observations does seem to be sufficient to get the gases you need to eliminate the false positives, which is really good news. Um, work by Natasha Latouf is also here, um, uh, shows that we can also think about what are the right specific uh, band passes we wanna look at in terms of increasing our detection capability for a gas like water based on what concentrations it, it is at. Um, and so this shows us that like, for example, if we want water uh, detections, it's working. We want water detections for like the Neoproterozoic or the modern, which is on the lower left. This is on the left side of the graph. We need to make sure that the, the center of this band is either at the 0.85 or 0.9 uh, micron place, because otherwise we aren't gonna achieve that with the, the other uh, center band passes. So we're thinking about how do we implement this? How do we go from a biosignature theory, right? Where we're worried about false positives to what the telescope has to do, like down to specific wavelengths and wavelength ranges and center points on the band passes. We are also thinking about the, you know, the, 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 it's almost a meme, right? But it's a true meme in our community that like you have to know thy star to know thy planet, right? And we're thinking about that for HWO as well. We're going to have UV spectroscopy capability on board all the way down to Lyman Alpha, perhaps farther, not with the coronagraph, but with other instruments for general astrophysics and to characterize the host star. Because we know that we know, we know that we need to know about that host star to know the planet, especially with the UV flux from the star. And then the last thing I'll talk about is think about all the surprises we had on the diversity of worlds that we've uncovered, the demographic, demographics of those diversity um, that we've uncovered from knowing the, the, the orbits and masses and radii of exoplanets, the surprises that that caused. Think about what you heard this week about what we're anticipating to, to, to tease about these planets' trends from chemical diversity and, and the surprise we're going to get there. And then think to that, to the stuff you heard about this week with JW and other spectroscopic missions, we're gonna add direct imaging, not just of the exo-Earths, but also of planets in every size, in orbit. well, not every size in orbit bin, but a, a larger variety of size in orbit, orbit bins. We could potentially have hundreds of direct imaging spectra in a, of, of a variety of exoplanets in addition to 25-ish exo-Earths, which is, I mean, just think about the science that that brings, especially in a context that's post JWST or um, after we've had 10 or 20 years of JWST data. And this is just what that looks like. This is a, you know, like the Kepler orrery, but this is like a simulation of a Louvoir. I think this is Louvoir A orrery. I just love this because the, the, the diversity of the worlds that we're going to be able to potentially probe and ask all kinds of science questions about. Forget the biosignature stuff. What science questions does this room want to ask about these worlds 20 years from now? 
I mean, those are gonna be some of the real big stories that come out of HWO. And so we're gonna have context. We're gonna have chemical context through the uh, uh, band pass of the chronograph, the, the spectral range of the chronograph. We're gonna have this, the context of the host, host star, and we're gonna have the context of the other planets that, that we can see in that planet's uh, solar system. Now, in addition to us understanding that context, oh, and one more thing, we're also gonna be able to do more transit spectroscopy, right? And we're gonna be doing it at wavelengths that are complementary to the facilities that are either uh, 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 operating now or that are gonna be operating between now and HWO. We could potentially go again, all the way down to Lyman Alpha, perhaps a little bit further and all the way out to about two microns, which really, I mean, think about like panchromatic transit spectroscopy of exoplanets, right? That's what we're talking about when you start stitching together these different missions. <clears throat> Now, the context we're going to do is not just about putting these planets in the context of what's going on around them, but also the context of what's going on around us. Um, big telescopes are also hella awesome for planetary science. Um, we, we can get really good spatial resolution of, for example, the plumes coming out of Europa, right, of solar system worlds in general. We can track, we can get good resolution on the surfaces of these worlds. Now, imagine, like, just down the, the, the walkway here, the Uranus, uh, Uranus community is having their own meeting about a Uranus uh, probe and orbiter mission. Imagine HWO looking at Uranus and its moons at the same time that that thing is orbiting and descending uh, into Uranus. Like that's, that's awesome. Like the power of, and this is part of what I love about this is like someone brilliant is gonna figure out a way to combine these images with, or if we get them and you know, with the, the things that, that that mission's doing in ways you couldn't do, the science you couldn't do with just one on their own. Like the power of combining things is, is just super cool. Um, and we're also going to put it in a much bigger context of the things that are happening far away from us, right? Like I, I talk sometimes about HWO not being an, a, a biosignature mission, but about it being an astrobiology mission, right? Where astrobiology is the study of the origins of uh, diversity and fate of life in the universe. And, and the origins isn't just about how planetary systems form, but how the universe that we live in led to the habitable, the conditions that can lead to habitable worlds. And, and we're going to do a lot of work with high resolution spectroscopy, or, um, well, both high resolution spectroscopy and high resolution imaging um, all the way down into the ultraviolet. So we can tease apart the history of, of, of our own universe and how that led to the, the, the habitable worlds that we have today. And then lastly, there's all kinds of questions that we don't know to ask today that HWO is gonna be able to answer. This is the Hubble deep field. And, and like the story here is like, they, they, they just put pointed this at a dark patch of the sky it was a fishing expedition, right? They just wanted to see what was there. And, and it, it was a shock to see that that was like teeming with galaxies, right? So there's also gonna be something creative that some future grad student or postdoc decides to do with HWO that's not a part of this spiel today, but it's gonna be something awesome a while from now, not tomorrow. Now, here's the part where like, we have to be real about this. Like these things aren't easy, right? <laughs> Flagship mission, missions, like space is hard, Flagship missions are really hard. Um, complex large projects are hard. And, and so like one of the big concerns people have is like, you know, are, can you avoid the worst fates programmatically in terms of the cost and the schedule and things like that? That's a, that's a legit concern. And we take that seriously. In fact, we've all been looking at lessons we can learn, not just from the things we have done in astrophysics, what our colleagues have done in other parts of the science mission directorate where we do planetary and other other areas of science at NASA. We look at other parts of the agency. We're looking now at other sectors, right? Like a highway is a large complex project. Running the Olympics is a large complex project. Massive websites are large complex projects. And if you start to look across large com complex projects, no matter what sector of our economy it sits in, you see trends. First of all, you see something terrifying, which is a tiny, tiny percent of large projects stay on schedule, on budget, and deliver their original intended performance, right? Now that's the, that's the scary news. This is why it's tough to fall asleep at night sometimes. The good news is the ones that make it through, that 0.1% that stay on schedule, on budget, and deliver their performance, they have a lot of things in common, right? And we're building, and by the way, those things that, that have been identified by literal research on this, are consistent with things in these, these mission study reports, consistent with the agency's own assessments of how we can do these missions better, consistent with like the, G the government accountabilities office survey of such things. There's a consensus that's emerged on how to do these things better. I'm not gonna go into detail about it because it's really programmatic, 
But the, 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 one of the big lessons is you want to lock your scope in early and you want to get an advanced start on your technology development. And that's what we're going to do next to make HWO a reality. The start of the science technology architecture review team is going to start us off, thank you, um, by setting our science scope. It's going to start with the decadal survey that led to the recommendation to, to do HWO and take the science priorities in the decadal survey and turn them into performance metrics that we would like HWO to hit to realize the ambitious science that decadal, science, that decadal survey asked for. That's going to be working hand in hand with the TAG, the technical assessment group. Um, the technical assessment group is going to be looking at architectures, um, technologies that we need to study and develop now so we understand them incredibly well when we start to really ramp up the spending on this. Those two teams are separate for really a, a legal reason more than anything else. The second group, the TAG, is going to be making recommendations to myself and Julie Crook, my colleague who's the program executive on HWO, on what our high priorities are for technology development, what our high priorities are for architecture deep dives, some science priorities for things we want to study early. And we're going to turn those into calls that people in the community and institutions in the community can, can compete for. And because of that recommendation and prioritization to us, we needed to have kind of a separate legal internal to the agency group looking at those things to keep all of you and everyone else outside the agency clear legally and, and, and capable of competing without being conflicted for those open competitions. So there's a legal reason they're separated, but those things that the tag are doing and the things that the start are doing are coupled, and we know that. So we're going to be asking those teams to work together as they do their work. And then lastly, while the we're doing the technical and the, the, the science and the technology development work, we also believe in building a strong community for HWO. Is that my time? Uh, I'll have questions after that. Okay, great. Um, and we know this is a multi-generation mission. We know that flagship missions, part of why they're special, the agency's flagship missions, are the, they're the people's telescopes, right? Like you as community members can propose and should propose for JW time. You will be able to propose for HWO time, right? So we want to have a strong community of of scientists that feel engaged with the mission then when we launch, but honestly, starting now throughout it, because if I'll just say this, if I am up here or in some other conference at HWO launch, still in my position, we will have failed. Like maybe we would have succeeded in launching the mission, but if I'm still in this role at launch, we've done something wrong with the culture on the team, right? Because I shouldn't still be here. One of you all should be here talking about HWO by then. Right? We need to have a culture understanding this is multi-generation in terms of how long the thing's going to last. And that means uplifting the generations that are out there in the audience today to have meaningful roles and leadership roles in this in the future. Um, so we're doing some stuff about that. Um, the starting the tag, I'll be honest, it's mostly going to be people more senior than, than y'all. Um, but we're asking them to bring their teammates, uh, the, the people that they directly uh, mentor on their research teams into the technical work they do for the start and the tag. We're additionally going to have a mentorship um, program that we're going to open up where the mentees in that program, uh, we're going to focus on early career people or, or relatively junior people to the people on the start of the tag coming from institutions that don't have representation on the start of the tag. So that's another thing we're aware of, like, like Jamie and Amber and Natasha, like they work with me or other people at, at NASA, they, they know how to get into this stuff. We also want to make sure that our mentorship program is open to people that don't have that, that kind of access. Um, and then we want to spin up a place for you all to have your own space to talk to each other about HWO, um, whether that's a conference, whether that's a Slack channel, maybe it's a Discord, I don't know. But we want to support the early career community having its own community on HWO. And then the last thing is we want to have workshops because while we're doing all that for the start and the tag, we want to have conversations, like real open, honest conversations, but how do we build a better culture going forward for the mission once the project ramps up? We do all that. We do all that, then we're going to come together as a community to like make a beautiful image like this, which is like that's the future we're looking forward to. And I want to see that on this screen one day. Um, and I think, oh, these are the questions I got. I, I was like hanging out with some of the students last night. I was like, what should I answer? These are the things I think I got to most of them. How do you get involved? I think I got that. What is the tag? Oh, how big is it? I don't know. The starting the tag, starting the tag will tell us how big it's going to be. Um, is, how much is it Louvoir or Habex? Yes and no. It is both and either. Like we're going to build off of Louvoir and Habex. We're also going to do new things and move past it. What is start? I think I said that. What's the timeline? 
Um, eat your carrots, don't burn out, exercise, that's the timeline. And is it a real thing? That's the goal, all right? What, what does it mean to become a real thing? Like, it's an all hands on deck. Hope you can become part of it. Um, and if you got questions, let us know. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sean. That was a great talk. Over the history of astrobiology, there's been, I'm thinking of the Viking missions, there's been an expectation and an excitement about what it could deliver about these big questions. And now with the, the HWO and, and the field of exoplanets, there's certainly an excitement and an expectation. Um, I don't think anyone wants to disappoint, right? We don't want the answer to come back and be ambiguous. So how do you deal with the possibility of delivering an ambiguous answer? And what advice can you give us about dealing with that type of, of concern. Yeah, I think it's gonna be hard because it's like like we're 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 a ways away, right? And I the thing I don't want to get caught in is the, like I call it the water on Mars problem, right? Like there's water on Mars. NASA found water on Mars, like ESA found water, like I don't know how many times y'all have seen the water on Mars headline, but it's a lot, right? Um, and then we it loses its its impact after a while, right? Um I'm a little worried about that where it's like, you know, NASA is going to do this cool thing. NASA is going to do this cool thing. NASA is going to do this cool thing, having the same impact. So I think part of it is setting some real expectations that we're still a ways away, but it's still exciting that the journey is starting now. Um, that's for me. I think the, the second thing is when we ever, whenever we make this announcement, whatever target it happens, whether it's exoplanets inside the solar system, um, the, the challenging thing will be we're going to have some standards that the community is going to help us develop for, for, for what we have to do, and actually the community is already, is already developing, for what we have to achieve to say, yeah, we think we found life beyond Earth, okay? When we do that, we're gonna have to be clear with the, with, with the public that we think we did, but we won't know for 20 years whether this is the moment or not. Because honestly, the real test of whether or not we did find evidence of life beyond Earth is not the evidence that's in that first paper. It's whether or not the conclusions of that first paper hold up over time after some grad student or postdoc says, yeah, but this, and they make a prediction for the yeah, but this, and the people on the original paper or someone else says, you know, let's build some tests. Maybe, maybe it's with a different wavelength range with life, right? Maybe you build something that can get some spatial resolution later on, build some tests that discriminate between the people that say this wasn't biology and the people that say it does. It might be another mission. You might have to wait a while. Right, and, and then we'll know. So we're gonna be at this awkward point where we're gonna be at a moment in time that might be the moment that we know that we're not alone, but we won't know if that's the moment for another 20 years as scientists. And that's like, that's just really hard to communicate. I think the one good thing about this is the agency just hired a new senior scientist for astrobiology specifically to, to, to focus and, and do more work on this specific set of questions. Uh, Dr. David Grinspoon, and I think his first day is Monday. Um, and so he's going to be responsible for helping us with this, not just for exoplanets, but writ large. Thanks, Sean. This is Katie Bennett from Johns Hopkins University. I just want to know if there's anything that we should all be thinking about or doing over the next two decades so we can do our part to make sure that the timeline doesn't slip. Oh. Um, I was about to say, do what you love, which is like a cliche, but it's true. Um, and I, and I don't mean like just in the general sense, like, but, th but then you added the second part. Now, I, I think, um, the, the main thing that we can do as a science community is make sure that we've got a good, uh, collaborative relationship with each other because, and with the engineers, because we're going to hit a hard moment. We don't know what it is. And we don't know when it's going to hit us where we're going to have to have a very difficult conversation, like about maybe scope being lost somewhere or about, you know, delaying the, the launch. Like those are difficult conversations that are going to have to happen at some points. One of the reasons we believe strongly in having that good culture. And I think the thing that we can do more than anything else, I, I, it sounds so cliche, but it's so true is like, all right, now, like, now like the movie lines, like we should be excellent to each other, right? Like we should, 
like we and 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 to the engineers that we're going to be working with as well and 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 give some space to the person on the other side of the table that that has a different perspective intellectually and discipline wise that knows some stuff about what they're talking about and enter those conversations with that sort of respect and grace i think that's probably the, and just practice that with each other uh, until you're at that table or around that table and do excellent science Hello, um, my name is Rosario. I am a, I'm at the Graduate Center in CUNY, New York City. My question is, uh, what advice will you give a student who's just starting and trying to find their place in this field and doesn't really know where, which direction to take? So that's the one where I would lean into the do what you love. And I don't mean that in the generic sense. I, I'm, I'm going to be more specific. Like, and this is a, like, I take meetings with students. I'm happy to take one with you, like on Zoom. In the coming weeks or or any of y'all but i will tell you what i'm going to ask you if you can answer these questions i'm still happy to meet but we don't uh, you don't need to spend your time meeting with me like i tell i tell people find out not just like what you love in a generic sense to do but like do you want to like i am a terrible terrible chemist okay i'm a klutz i can't i cannot pay attention to detail i my first job in the sciences was in a chemistry lab and I, my experiments failed and I was messing up other people's experiments, right? And I hated it, right? Don't do that, okay? If, you, if you're like me. And then my advisor put me in front of a computer and had me code up some stuff. And some people hate being in front of a computer, right? I, I could be in front of a computer debugging stuff and working on that all day long and it doesn't feel like a chore to me. So when I say do what you love, I don't mean, you know, like, oh, you love astronomy? Go be an astronomer. I mean, like, like what are what are the things that other people find mundane or terrible that you're like oh I'm I'm ready to geek out about this right and that's like the kind of work you do you want to be an instrumentalist you want to be an observer do you want to be a field scientist um, do you want to be a modeler right do you want to be a, a lab person like that kind of thing also what questions do you like to to ask you know like do you like the big picture questions do you like the how do things work questions like the like be really introspective about what you like to do um, and then find the places that have opportunities to do that. And then the last part about this is, this is like, when I say this is hard, I don't mean it the same way I meant it before. Like this is hard at the human level, especially when you're all going through the parts of the career that all y'all are at right now, right? So build your support network with your peers and colleagues with senior people at other institutions or your home institution when you can. Um, and, and when you can, don't just find options for graduate school where there's one advisor that does the exact thing that you love, find, institutions, if you can, that have multiple options, especially for your PhD, um, because if it's not working with one advisor, having other places and people you can work with can literally be a career saver at, at, at most and, and at least less stressful if there's a mismatch um, at some point, because like I said, it's tough. So do what you love, find people that are going to love you um, and support you, um, and then find places where you've got options. And in general, open options up. Like the more you can expand options you're willing to consider at any stage in your career, the more likely one of those is going to work out for you. Absolutely. Um, I, I'd also say um, to add on to the build your support, um, you know, networking, don't be afraid to go talk to somebody who may be more senior than you that does something different than you and ask questions, right? So, um, you know, they're not all scary. <laughs> yeah, my, my email's right there. So, you know. Yeah, right. I'll be slow yeah, to reply, sure. but it's right there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, networking is probably the, the best thing that you can do. And, you know, we're all human beings. So, um, so don't be afraid. I guess that's that's my sorry. I don't know. Oh, it was awesome. Steal your thunder, but you know, Sean and I have worked Plus, together for a long time. He's one yeah. of my favorite people. And I think you probably all know why now. So, likewise, for real. <laughs>